anybody who's ever gone through the process knows that uh, you know every overnight success comes after like a lot of years of failure. Right. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but so there's no magic bullet, and and I think again that goes back to why we do it the way we do it, where we make it really personalized because. There is no one thing that works for everybody. If if it was, if there was, then everybody would do that one thing and then it would stop working. James Timberlake, welcome to the ROI Online Podcast. Amazing, right? So James, you are our project manager at ROI Online. You work with entrepreneurs and help them really get their clarity on their branding, their messaging, their their strategies on these projects. But it's a bit of a um, it's a bit of a struggle. And here's why you're good at it. You've worked with authors. Now imagine, audience you sitting down and writing a book, imagine how vulnerable you feel pulling out all your heart and laying it down and trying to get it organized and the ups and downs and emotions and thinking of all the criticism you might get when you publish this book. That's an emotional roller coaster. And yet James worked with over a hundred authors in the past doing this. James, what, what is it about you that for whatever reason, you really connected with those folks. I think for me, the reason is that really, I just genuinely am curious about people and their story and where they came from and why they think the way they think and why they do what they do. And when somebody is going through the process of writing a book or, or even, you know, if they're talking about their business, uh, they're, they're talking about their passion. They're talking about their life. And, and I, I just listen intently and sometimes that's all it takes. So, but then helping them get organized, helping guide them, helping direct them, helping to think in a different way, maybe consider things they weren't. How do you, how do you go about that? How do you lead someone that's feeling kind of naked and afraid in the wilderness how do you lead someone to safety in that process? Well, the first thing you, you do is you let them know they're safe, right? Like you, you have to provide a safe environment. So I need you to tell me the things that you care about and that you're passionate about, but I also need to know the things that you're scared about, the things you're insecure about. What are the things you don't like doing and what don't want to do? What are the things that make you kind of like shrug up and go into your protective mode? So that way, when those things come, I know how to help steer you around them or through them and just you know and that so that's i think the 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 thing you have to start with is that is that feeling of of safety so that way when you get further down the road and you do get to something where you need to push back or dig deeper they know that those questions because that's really all it is right is you're just asking questions clarifying questions over and over and over and over again and I'm only able to do that because they know I'm not asking to catch them in something, right? I'm not trying to prove them wrong. I'm trying to clarify their point, right? And I'm in it with you. Like we're doing this exploration together, right? It's not, it's not your book. It's our book for, for this time period. It's our book. It's our business for this time period. It's our business. And I'm just as invested in it for this time that we're talking as you are. I mean, yeah, obviously when the call's over, you're going to go off and write, you're going to go off and do your marketing, you're going to go off and serve your customers. And I'm not, that's, that's obviously the case. But in that moment, we should be of a, of a cord, right? And, and mm. all that is important is what is best for the business, the book, the, you as the author, as the entrepreneur. Um, and so anytime I'm asking a clarifying question, or if I'm coming at it from a different angle saying, okay, but what about this? Or what about this? And, I'm, and maybe I'm mirroring objections, or maybe I'm playing the role of a customer saying, well, why does it cost so much? Or why wouldn't I just go with this guy? They're the big name in the, in the, in the group, right? I'm not doing it to try to catch you. I'm doing it to make you think through well, what is the real reason people should come to me over so-and-so, or why do I charge as much as I charge? And having those open, honest conversations lead to a better understanding of, like, if it's a book, it's a better understanding of your message. If it's a business, it's a better understanding of your offering. Um, 
And so I think just being, again, providing a safe place and then pushing back with questions that come from a place of really wanting to understand, not challenge, uh, has been invaluable um, for, for the people that I've been working with. So you're listening or you may be watching on our YouTube channel, but we're talking with James Timberlake. He's a he's our project manager at ROI Online. This is um, one of a series of conversations with all of our team members as we kind of uh, uh, introduce everyone to those that there you'd be working with and learning a bit about how we approach helping uh, empower entrepreneurs and business owners to do a better job, um, clearly communicating to the audience online. So James, when you, um, when you started working with ROI, what was it at ROI that you liked? Maybe it was a culture. I don't, I don't know what specifically it was, but kind of tell us a little bit why you, uh, you like hanging around with, the ROI team. It's funny enough. It's kind of the, a little bit of what I was just talking about where there's just this sense of um, this sense of just genuine um, desire to improve and to and kind of everybody on the team has this, this idea of, of humble confidence that I really appreciate it. You know what I mean? Where, yeah, I might be an expert in this thing, uh, whether it's content or, or development or whatever, but I recognize that I'm not an expert in all these other areas, but I would like to still improve. And, and, I, and that's something that I've seen with pretty much, or not pretty much everybody in the ROI um, community, uh, both as, a, as internal team members, but also even I would say the, the vast majority of the clients that we work with, that that's their driving um, desire is to, to, to help others with the things that they're already an expert on, but also to solicit help from other experts in the areas that they're not competent or, or, or not to the level that they want to be. And, and that culture mentality, whatever you want to call it leads to constant growth. And, and that's something that appealed to me right from the beginning. And then it's kind of, I guess if you want to call it the cherry on top is that everybody's really nice, right? Like everybody's just a great person in general. It would still be worth it if they weren't really nice, but the fact that they are is just like a cherry on top. You know, it's cool that you said that about our uh, clients. They really are a big part of our culture. We really do get this fulfillment from working with them. And it really does make something special about um, our just being a part of our team and having them as a part of our, our experience. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. That's, and I say this all the time to you and other people, but like my favorite part about what I do is getting on the calls and, and talking with the clients, right. That's so that's um, and that's always been the case, like in other previous positions, whether we're talking about the author stuff, but even before that um, in, in my various marketing roles, things like that, it was always the conversations that I liked. It was always the connection with people that, that made it worthwhile and the better quality person you work with, obviously the better uh, those conversations go. And, and so in that sense, ROI is really lucky because like we said, we, we have really, really great just people that we get to serve and work with uh, in general. And, and then we get to have these conversations that are incredibly important and really move the needle for them um, and really help them have clarity on what they are doing from week to week to week. Mm -hmm. And, and for me, that's such a joy because we get to share in their excitement and their growth. And um, so I don't know, for me, I guess that's, that's something that um, is important. And I think increasingly rare because so many things, as, as much as we use automation, we use automation to support the personal connections, right? We, we get rid of, we automate the crap that nobody, that doesn't require the personalization, doesn't require the, the, the in-person so that we can maximize that connection with clients and, and customers. And I think there's this, this trend that so many people that come to us, they've kind of gotten burned by this idea of, Oh, you know, you just make a thousand memes, put it out there. You'll get a whole bunch of likes and clicks and that'll be cool. Somehow that'll equal money. 
And, and it, you know, it doesn't for the average business person, like, nobody cares. Like, yeah, you might have a huge following, but if those people aren't buying from you, they're not connecting from you, then what have you accomplished? You know, like other than an actual influencer, what, how, how is that a, you know, a good marketing strategy, whatever. And then when we, when we have conversations and we start talking about what people actually care about in their business and, and we, we kind of take away this, this artificial need of, well, I need millions of likes and followers. It's like, well, how many customers do you really have and need? Well, I serve like 20 people at a time and it's super high touch and it's high class and all this other crap. And, you know, it's really expensive. So it's like, do you really need millions of followers or do you just need a, the right people to know who you are and engage with them on a personal level? Yeah, I kind of need to do that. So then why, are, why is your marketing strategy not in any way aligned with that goal? Instead, it, it seems like you want to be an Instagram model. And they're like, yeah, I don't want to do that. So then stop pretending to be that. And um, it's neat going through that. It's kind of neat going through that light bulb moment with people. And you can see it in their eyes when that, when that resonates. And they, they find like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And there's just an alignment. And um, yeah, I don't even remember what the question was. Uh, but, that, <laughs> that's the, but it's just really cool because then we see that it, it, almost week after week, especially on like the pit stop calls, right? Where it's, it almost seems like week after week, there's a little bit of an epiphany. Let's talk, let's, let's clarify what the pit stop is and why it came into, um, yeah, came into existence. It, so we were originally, when we started a do for you agency, that's the default business model where we would um, bring on clients and do everything for them. But this past year and a half, it's really become clear that we needed to offer some other services that folks need other than just to do for you because we had attrition. We had a lot of people put on the brakes because of the uncertainty of what's going on in the future with their business. And, but yet they're out educating and they're out learning, they're, re they're researching, they're looking. And part of our business model is that we have a regularly scheduled strategy session with our clients, our do for you clients. And, and this is something that we started offering to folks that maybe they don't need our team to do all the work, but what they need is a little bit of brainstorming. They need someone to bounce it off of. They need someone like, like the process that you were going through with the authors that let's ask some questions. Let's dig around. Let's get to the real why of what you're doing. And so kind of talk about a little bit how our, your experiences with the folks that you started walking through our pit stop process, what's going on? What are they experiencing? Well, when they first, obviously everybody's different, but generally speaking, when, when on our first call, the first half of the first call is usually a lot of them telling us what they think they're supposed to be doing. Right. And then somewhere around halfway through, we'll, we'll start getting to, okay, what is it you want to do? And then we finally get to what you should be doing. Right. And so for them, a lot of it in the beginning is just chipping away at these false assumptions just through, like I said, this question and answer you know, and talking and, and having to have really open and honest discussion about what marketing or, or initiatives you've done in the past. And we we talk about everything. It depends on the client, but I mean, we could talk about everything from pricing structure to messaging, to copy, to, you know, entire uh, strategies and that, and that's fine. It depends on where they're at. So I would say that kind of the universal thing they get is in the beginning clarity and then after they have at least some clarity of where they currently are, they have a real, real clear view of where they are and where they want to go. Then the, the weekly calls, what that does is it helps us recalibrate on a consistent basis, right? So that every week we're saying, okay, so now let's do this process over, but really quickly, right? So now we don't have to get rid of any of the illusions. Now we, we know exactly what we're doing. What did we do last week? This is what I did last week. Okay, cool. Now that you've done that, what results did you get from it? And how does that change where we're at now? And how does that change our assumptions for the future? And do we need to make any adjustments for our long-term goal? And then we can make sure that we're still taking those. And then we just, then we just talk through, okay, what are we going to do next week? 
And we make it really, really easy for somebody who has really lofty goals to make consistent progress because we validate that consistent, that big goal. And, and Ashley is a perfect example yeah. where, you know, when she came in, she thought she was a product, right? She had one product. She's like, I just want to sell this one product. Mm -hmm. And through the course of this dialogue, she realized I don't have a product. I have a mission, right? Yeah. But the product was what she thought she had to have to eventually do her mission, right? But her mission is what she cared about. So then we changed her long-term goal to better uh, represent what her passion was long-term. We said, okay, this is your long-term goal. Maybe we still start with the product. Maybe that's how you fund your long-term goal. But now at least we're being honest about where you really want to go. And then as soon as that was very clear in her mind, everything took off, right? Because now her mind is focused on this goal and her passions aligned with that goal. And so everything she does, every opportunity she sees is held up to that. Okay. Does this match my long-term goal? Can it help me get there? And every week she has somebody in this case, me go, okay, great. Tell me why, mm -hmm. tell me how validate your assumptions. Oh, Hey, I want to build this. I want to build this. I want to build this. I saw all these great things. I think it's going to really help me with my goal. Awesome. Why? How are you sure? And so then we can start talking through, honestly, is this going to help move the needle? And if so, is it, do we do it now? Do we do it six months from now? Or do we do it a year from now? What else do we need in place for this idea to work? And then you can start working backwards. And we do that on a, like I said, either weekly or biweekly basis. So that way you don't go off on rabbit trails. Um, and, yeah. and, and you're, but you're able to consistently update your goal. You're able to maintain, um, you're able to maintain momentum while still being, uh, while still being flexible and still being adaptable. You think about that situation. If you're um, a marketing agency and you're wanting to meet your goals, make your quotas and, um, an Ashley comes to you and says, whatever she wanted, you know, wants to do, then immediately you're going to go, okay. And you start quickly assembling the tactical applications that would be required to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. But what Ashley really needed was to discuss it and think about it in the bigger picture, which totally brought the strategy into the conversation. And then that started to guide. And that's all of a sudden, that's when the light bulb really went off for her. And she started to have real clarity in her direction, clarity in what she was about, clarity in what she wanted to accomplish. And then, like you said, you're able to backfill it and start to arrange the tactical things to support the overall strategy. Yeah. And, what, and then once you do that, the shiny object syndrome it doesn't go away, but it's definitely manageable, right? Then, um, because not everybody needs a YouTube channel. Not everybody's there yet. Not, a, But it's a, it's a shiny object that everybody talks about, right? Uh, but maybe I don't need that today. Maybe I need that six months from now. Or, oh my gosh, I, I just heard about, um, you know, Clubhouse. mysticals. Clubhouse. Yeah. Oh, that's a huge one, right? Oh, I just heard about Clubhouse. How do I get on Clubhouse? I got to be on Clubhouse. You know how many fake entrepreneurs are on Clubhouse? It's ridiculous, <laughs> right? And the odds of you popping into the random one where, you know, Gary V or something pulls you out of a crowd of however many and answers your question specifically. Could it happen? Absolutely. Is it, is it wise to build a marketing plan on it? Probably not. You know, um, but again, it depends on who you are. For some people, Clubhouse has been an absolute godsend, you know, mm -hmm. and for them, it's allowed them to, to accelerate and, and really engage with an audience that they've already, that they already had, but didn't have conversations with. But if you don't already have that audience, it may or may not make sense to try to build it there first, you know? And again, that's where having conversations as opposed to um, kind of edicts of like the marketing rules, like here are the 10 things that we do for every client. It's like, mm -hmm. Does every client need all 10 things? Maybe, but probably not in, in a lot of cases. And th I think that's the other thing that it, at least on the talking about the pit stops, uh, the first couple of calls, it's, it's interesting to hear some of the feedback that we get. They're like, man, you know, like the call we had on Monday or that I had on Monday, um, the couple we were working with and they, they said, 
uh, you know, man, when we went to these other people, like we just told them we needed a website and they just built the website. Like when we told you we needed a website, you said, well, why? <laughs> and then we ended up having a, you know, like a three hour conversation over the course of a couple of weeks. And mm -hmm. then at the end of it, they go, you still need a website, but now we know what it's for. Yeah. Yeah. You know, well, now we know why we have it. And, and they go, they didn't, they didn't understand our brand. They didn't understand our passion. They didn't and so now when we go and we're doing a website audit, it's not us saying, Hey, here's all the things that are technically wrong with it. At, you know, in a vacuum, it's, Hey, this doesn't serve your mission because of this, or this doesn't serve your mission because of that reason. And they go, Oh, that makes so much sense. And, and it's they, more of an educational thing for them as opposed to just purely prescriptive. And so they're seeing it along with you and, yeah. and they're growing. So they're having this, this experience where things that were foggy are becoming more clear and you can see the energy rise in them because they're being empowered with clarity through this experience that they're getting to have these weekly conversations as we go and really dial in specifically what's best for them. Yeah, exactly. And like I said, I think not only does that, not only does that help them, you know, as far as like momentum and things like that, um, especially in the beginning, like really just focus on the things that are going to move the needle right now while being, while still honoring what you want to happen five, 10 years from now, where you want to be. Um, but I think it also, it gives them an opportunity to, again, that safe space, right? It gives them an opportunity to sometimes just go, God, you know, I hate doing videos on YouTube or LinkedIn or whatever else. I don't want to be that person. I go, I get it. I don't either. You know, like, I don't feel like, and they go, I don't feel like I should have to be um, a celebrity to sell. I'm a good carpenter. I just want to sell like really good cabinets. All right, cool. So like, let's build a marketing strategy around that. Like you don't have to be what other people tell you to have to be. You should honor what you're good at and the people you want to serve and start from that. And I think part of that is just as important is understanding the things you're not good at and things you don't want to do and things that, that suck energy out of you right? And get rid of those, find alternative solutions that, to your point, raise your energy, get you excited. Because in every case that we've, that at least that we've seen, and, and the same was true with authors, the people that get to the end are people that are passionate about what they're doing. And the thing that they're doing aligns with their goal, right? Like if you yeah. can get those, there's a resilience that's built into that. And the people that burn out are the people that feel like, I can't do more of this soul draining work for that goal. At some point, it's no longer worth the cost uh, trade-off, right? And I think so many people have accepted this fact that if you're an entrepreneur or, or if you're a business pers or person and you're writing a book, an author, whatever it is, that there's these certain things that you have to do um, as opposed to seeing it as an opportunity to be inventive or creative or find your own path. It's like, anyway, so just having those conversations in a safe space where you can be vulnerable and say, these are the things I like, these are the things I don't like. And I want to be, I want to honor those things. Okay, cool. Let's do that. Mm -hmm.